some years ago, I was working for a not-for-profit housing corporation, and we were going to build affordable housing for migrant farm workers working in South Florida. And as we looked at the land that we were going to purchase, some people told us that it was an occasional habitat for the endangered Florida scrub jay. Now, I kept walking that land and saying, over my dead body is some bird going to stop our building housing for people in need. And so several days later, when the state inspector came to look at the, at the landscape, I said to him, you know, even if the scrub jays do nest here, I've been praying that they better not show up today. <laughs> they didn't. The housing got built. So as a Catholic sister, I have spent a good number of my years really working to alleviate human suffering. And I didn't realize that I was missing some other populations. I became a lawyer in order to represent underserved people. I said populations, but I really meant people. So several years later, I'm in a car and listening to a talk, driving across North Carolina, and listening to a talk by Thomas Berry. And he is describing the incredible ecological devastation happening because of our insatiable drive for fossil fuels. And then he talks about the scarring of the landscape as we consistently extract minerals from the, from the earth. And what he says next is that the primary cause of this destruction is our human perception that we are separate and not a part of the natural world. And that this sense of separation, he said, was actually the cause of the environmental crisis. And that this environmental crisis was also a spiritual crisis because we have forgotten who we are, and we have forgotten that we belong. So I can still, oh, I can still remember the next thing Thomas said to me. See, to me, I was listening to a tape, but I really. <laughs> and he said, you know, I believe that if we had a true Earth democracy and all the other species could vote, they would vote us off the planet. <laughs> I nearly drove off the road. <laughs> that was a very shocking idea to me at that time. But as I think back, I can still feel how the, 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 the disturbing impact that Thomas's words had on me. And he literally changed my life. And so, like a seed that germinates, Thomas's concepts that nature had rights to exist and flourish started to take roots in me. And from, not immediately, but because until that time, I had never ever thought about the other species. Remember the scrub jay? <laughs> um, and so I was totally engaged in a very important work of trying to alleviate human suffering and working for human rights. But because of that, I was so focused on that, I actually ignored the rest of the community. And who was missing? All of the other beings that are in our neighborhood. The trees and the, and the plants that do our photosynthesis for us. Um, the, the bees and the butterflies and the insects that do our pollination. Our water, all of, all of which we can't live without. And it just hadn't come to uh, recognition in me. So um, Thomas's words really started to shift my consciousness. And Thomas, if you don't know, was a priest. He was uh, an author, a scholar of world religions. <laughs> and he called himself a geologian because he said he learned from the earth. Now, Thomas, is, he was heavily influenced by Teilhard de Chardin. 
And his core philosophy, I would say, is twofold. Number one, he would say, first of all, we all belong to a single emergent community. And secondly, the perception that we humans think that we're separate from the rest of the natural world, again, is the cause of so much of our environmental destruction. And furthermore, Thomas would say that this destruction is, is not, you know, we're not all that conscious about the effects of our behaviors. But he said, like, our legal systems, and that's how I got into it as a lawyer, that our legal systems actually support that destruction. If you do any environmental work, you know you have to, quote, get a permit. Well, that's what our law does. It permits a lot of, legal, uh, of environmental destruction. And furthermore, our economic system and business practices put their primary focus on short-term economic benefit and, doesn't, and does not look at long-term environmental cost. And nor does it really take into consideration that we live on a finite, confined planet. Not everything is renewable. So because we, we live kind of in this unconscious way, it's almost as though we have amnesia and that we can't remember who we are and the consequences of our actions, and so we keep repeating the same thing. And the earth keeps suffering. Now, when I talk about the earth, I mean people too. Because, see, most of us think if you're talking about the environment, we're not talking about ourselves. We're talking about, we're all a part of it. So, I want to say that we absolutely have to continue to care for the wounded and hungry and people who are poor in our neighborhoods and communities. But I invite us to extend that care to the wider community as well. Our culture reinforces this sense of human superiority and anthropocentrism. And our institutions don't teach us that we are actually kin, K-I-N, genetically and energetically to all other beings on the planet. And so that reinforces this sense that we as humans are at the top of this pyramid of supposedly the great circle of life. And so it's, uh, and when we keep ourselves in that position, then we cannot actually let ourselves communicate close enough to nature that we really start caring about it to protect it. So this great pyramid, it reminds me that we often think of ourselves as though the, you know, as though the earth rotates around us, <laughs> not the sun. And so sometimes I, I ask myself, really, was Copernicus wrong? <laughs> so this sense of our illusion of our separation is really very dangerous because it lets us live in a worldview that we, we think that the laws of nature and even the laws of physics don't apply to us. And therefore, we can continue our actions of destruction and we will see, and we know, but from our head up, we know that our glaciers are melting, that the oceans are warming, that small island nations are disappearing, and we still continue to do the same behavior. So it's as though we are anesthetized and we can't really change. So, you know, it is time for change. And a lot of our indigenous brothers and sisters have been able to maintain their sense of mutuality, respect, and even reverence for the earth and for the natural world. But for those of us that live in, in a Western society and culture, it's going to take a major transformation of consciousness, of culture, and of economics, and of legal systems to bring about the change if we're all going to go into the future sustainably. So Aldo Leopold taught back in the 1940s that we we live in a single community, he called it the land community. He was a conservationist. And he created, he was one of the first people to create a land ethic. And he said that this land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include the soils, the waters, the plants, the animals, or collectively the land. Now you'll notice that people are missing there. See, it's so, it, it doesn't mean that the people aren't a part of that, but it's, it's so embedded in our consciousness 
uh, he wanted to raise up the rest of the members of the community. So he called it the land community. Scientist Stephen Harding calls this single home the animate earth. James Lovelock calls it Gaia. Thomas Berry called it the earth community. In each of those, the, the unifying factor is that every being bears differentiated rights to exist and to flourish. Now, what do these rights look like? Well, Thomas would say that the, that, that the core rights of nature are threefold. We have the right to exist, the right to habitat, and the right to flourish in ever, uh, ever evolving systems of the earth process. And when we do that, we allow our ecosystems, for example, to become considered centrally as we are establishing sustainable communities. And laws of nature will try to shift that sense of property so that we look at it differently and that we can we look at how we buy and sell property as an object or a commodity and we're going to then give that property protection through guardianship of some way so that that property can't be bought and sold without its interests also being considered. We're talking about balance. So one of the leading advocates of earth democracy is Vandana Shiva. She's a renowned uh, international environmental activist and physicist. And she says that human rights and earth rights coexist. And so if they coexist, it's important for us to remember that human rights cannot cancel out the rights of other beings as well. Now, what does this look like? Fortunately, we have models emerging around the world. In 2008, Ecuador adopted a constitutional, they adopted an entirely new constitution. But in that constitution, they provided constitutional protection to its mountains, waters, and land. First country in the world to do that. So what I'm talking about isn't only theory. It is actually beginning to be actualized. And so that got tested. In, two, in, in a couple years later, 2010. And so the Villa Cambamba River, which is at the picture of it here, um, was being filled in by a road building project. And the court ruled on behalf of the river's right to flow freely. <laughs> First case in the world. <laughs> and so, who was building the road? The provincial government. They had to take the debris out of the river, and change the route of the road. So Ecuador inspired many other governments and organizations. And so in 2010, Bolivia hosted the conference, the World's People's Conference on the Rights of Mother Earth and Climate Change. Um, I was privileged to be there when that group of 35,000 people adopted the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. And a couple of years, like in the next year, Bolivia took that to the United Nations, and it's now been debated, and some of that language is beginning to show up in its documents and resolutions. Just last year, New Zealand was our second country to give a river legal rights. The Wanganui River, long considered a sacred river by the, the, by the Iwi Maori tribe, and it was given the same rights as a corporation, legal personhood, with guardians to protect it. So, if we can have rights there, why not here? <laughs> and let's start with the St. John's, which is so incredibly central to the identity of this community. And, when, and let's give it guardians to, to return it to its health and its historic flow and quality. Then let's move on to the Ichnatukni River, and I don't know if you've ever kayaked or paddled that. It's an incredible river. And then the Suwannee River, which is considered the jewel of the south. I work a lot on freshwater springs. Let's give rights of nature to our springs. We know that our waters in Florida are incredibly degrada degradated, 
And so what I want to say to you is that in 2018, Florida has a mandated constitutional revision commission. We can work towards bringing, bringing a Bill of Rights for Water to the state of Florida. So the rights of nature, <laughs> the rights of nature, the time for it is now because indeed we all hold the fate of the earth in our hands. And I want you to hear the words of the poet Denise Levertov, who so poignantly wrote, we have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How could we tire of hope? So much is in bud. Thank you.